Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Brandon, and it's great to see you all on this brisk and beautiful November morning. Hey, we have a great service planned here at Calvary this morning, and we have the honor and the privilege to have our preschool and kindergarten King's kids along with us, so let's welcome them at this time. It's great to have them here. We at Calvary believe that our kids are an integral part of the church at this time and in this present day. And so we love that they can be here with us, that they can lead us all as one family and one body in worship. So before we jump into worship, before our kids lead us, they're going to open us up with a couple of songs.
my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeing you as a precious jewel, or to give up. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate you leading us. That song takes me back. Am I allowed to say that as a 40-year-old? I don't know, but it certainly does. Uh, it's great when we have our kids up here, not just performing, but leading us in worship and just to continue to cast vision for what we do and why we do it. We say here at Calvary Church that our kids are not just the future of the church, but they're an integral part of the church in the here and now, and we believe if we have them connected to the life of the church from an early age, more likely to stay connected to the church and connected to their faith as they grow older. Welcome to Calvary Church this morning. My name is Bo Eckert, the senior pastor here at the church, and I'm so glad that you've come to join us this morning for this worship service, whether you're here in the auditorium listening over the radio or the internet. Thank you for coming, and I know that there are some of you that are here this morning for the very first time, and I want to warmly welcome you. Calvary's a big church. We know that it's a big church, but we work hard to make this big church feel like a family, and one of the ways that we do that is with those that are new, those that are here for the very first time, we have an environment with, that we designed with you in mind. We call it our welcome gathering. It takes place right after this service ends in the east end of the lobby to my right, to your left. There's a room out there, big sign, big banner that says welcome gathering. Take no more than 10 minutes of your time. Would love for you to be able to come to meet me, to meet some staff members, to get questions about Calvary Church answered. It's just a way to help you to connect uh, as you are wanting more uh, information about Calvary Church. Now, as always in a big church, there's lots going on. Uh, we put a bulletin in your hand every week. This is our primary way of communicating with you, so there's lots of information in here, including an insert that will tell you a little bit about our Global Focus weekend next weekend. Lots of things happening that weekend, so look that over, take a look at that. And if you can, be here next Sunday morning as we roll out our Malawi initiative. It's gonna be an exciting, exciting morning. 
Thanksgiving is coming, and that means it's Thanksgiving offering time here at Calvary Church. We have a Thanksgiving service that's 10 a.m., not p.m., but 10 a.m., Thanksgiving uh, morning uh, for you to come and and be a part of that. And uh, you've received the last two weeks, didn't get it today, but the last two weeks, uh, the the insert about our Thanksgiving offering. If you haven't been here the last two weeks, you can pick one of these up uh, at one of the connection centers to let you know about where our Thanksgiving offering uh, will be going. And, and who will be helping this year. Um, so we encourage you to, to think about ways uh, to, to consider giving above and beyond your regular giving uh, to our Thanksgiving offering this year. And we have the privilege this year, uh, if you look on this sheet, of, of partnering with and helping Uptown Community Church. And this morning, we want to look, talk a little bit more about that partnership and about what's happening there. So we have Walter Sotelo, uh, one of the leaders, one of the pastors there at that church. He is going to join me up on the platform now. Um, Walter, many of you will know that name. You'll recognize his face. He's got a great connection uh, here at Calvary Church. He's been part of the New York Gospel Outreach, where our teens go every summer. And Walter was also a part of the Sandy Relief uh, teams and projects that we uh, sent teams up there. It's been two years now. Two years now, yeah. yes. Well, Walter, it's good to see you. Welcome. I know that part of your family came with you, but not all of them, but uh, the whole family's up there on the screen. Welcome to Calvary Church. Tell us a little bit about your family. Thank you. Good morning, Calvary. How are you today? Amen. Amen. And if you're here as a visitor, I want to say just uh, welcome to New York City. How you doing? <laughs> you doing all right, huh? My family, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be able to have a beautiful wife, uh, Victoria, and uh, my little daughter, Layla, who happened to be in the Sunday school this morning. So if you've been a teacher, thank you for teaching. My son, Luciano, also was there. And then my oldest daughter, uh, Sophia, who is right now, I think at this time, has been interviewed in a high school to be able to be... uh, Hopefully, Lord willing, receiving a scholarship to be able to go through this high school in New York City. Uh, Please pray for that. I'm just like plugging that in right there, I guess. (laughs) Hey, when you got the mic, there's not much I can do about it. Thank you guys up there. Appreciate it. They could turn it off, though, so be careful. I know. know. We know who holds the power now. (laughs) That's right. It's certainly not me. So, Walter, we've, uh, we're, we're excited to, to be a part of what you guys are doing here at Calvary Church. We are interested in what's happening here locally in Lancaster County. We're interested in what's happening globally. We've got over 100 global partners out there. But we love to have these connections with other like-minded churches. You're in the heart of New York City. The cultural context is very different than Lancaster County. But you're all about Jesus, just Amen. like that we're all yes. about Jesus Amen. and the gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ. And we want to help in what you're doing there. Tell us a little bit about the community that you live in. Tell us a little bit about the church and how the church is reaching those people. Help the people of Calvary Church to have a greater vision for your heart and for what you're doing through Uptown Community Church in New York City. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Um, New York City, you've heard of the city. Uh, It is probably one of the most influential cities in the world. Some of you hate it. Some of you love it. Like New Yorkers, we have a love and hate relationship. Manhattan is one of the boroughs of uh, New York City. There's five. Manhattan is only 12 and a half miles long. Our church is located in the north part of Manhattan, a, a neighborhood called Washington Heights and Inwood. It was actually, if you like history, is the neighborhood where the Indians actually sold, or Native Americans, politically correct, sold the island to the Dutch for $16. And it is a neighborhood that is nestled between parks. So it's a beautiful neighborhood. We actually feel like we're in suburbia New York City, even though you could actually ride the subways and do all of that. Now, our neighborhood is divided into two different people. We have the least, the last, and the lost, people that have been immigrants that have come in from other countries. 75% of our demographics are people from Dominican Republic. They speak Spanish, they're unreached, many of them with a lot of problems and not a lot of difficult circumstances that are facing. One bedroom apartment, just to give you a little, a little picture, will cost maybe about $1,100 rent, and there's maybe seven to eight people living in that apartment. That's an average. Now, we also have the professionals. During 9-11, many of the professionals that lived in Manhattan in Battery Park around, time, uh, around the Twin Towers moved away because they were afraid that they were going to have another terrorist attack. So they chose our neighborhood to move into. And as you know, professionals, if they're very driven about performance and they don't get to do it, what happens? They get very discouraged and they get depressed. And then they get disconnected from their community. And they have a challenge and a problem trying to get back 
and on their feet. So we're reaching those that are professionals as well as those that are really without resources. And we covet your prayers. Let me say this. Without prayer, nothing will take place. And if we're not connected to Jesus and abiding in him, we can do nothing. So it is important that for us, a church, to remain connected to the Lord so that when we talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, they actually do hear the life, the abundant life that lives inside of us. It's exciting for us at Calvary to partner with somebody like Walter and the church that he's a part of. It helps us to lift our eyes up off of ourselves and see what God is doing and to realize that we are just one expression of the local church, but we want to partner with other local churches that are like-minded and are interested in seeing life change through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know that that's Walter's heart and we're excited about that. One of the tangible ways that we're partnering with them is next weekend, we're sending a team up to be with you to hang That's out with right. you for yes. the weekend. Yes. One of our elders is leading that team. So. Tell us a little bit about what they're going to be yes. doing. Uh, if you're here, I'm going to be meeting with you hopefully after the service. So it's going to be fantastic. Imagine this. In New York City, one in every four children in Manhattan still go hungry at night. This is America. And we have families that don't have enough resources to be able to provide a meal for their families. So Thanksgiving is coming up and it's a time of celebration, is it not, right? We're celebrating the abundance of what God's blessing has been to America. And we commanded an initiative to try to be able to feed families in our neighborhood that don't have resources. And we started with a goal of 400. When I shared the vision with all these other little churches in our neighborhood, it grew to 800. And now we have 12 churches partnering. We have over 500 volunteers. We have farmers donating produce, fresh produce from New York State. I'm looking for some birds, though. I'm looking for chickens. I'm looking for turkeys. I'm looking for anything that's protein that can be included in that bag. You know why? This is why we do it the way that we do it. Missionaries are coming to New York City to get involved with us. You know why? Because Jesus, Jesus did it this way. You know what he did? He met the needs of people. He didn't speak to people without feeding them. When he spoke with them, he didn't leave them without feeding them. There's something about the connectivity of our body and our soul and our spirit. Once you meet the need, then you have the ear of the person. And guess what? The ear leads to the heart of the person. So we definitely want to share Jesus Christ and the gospel that sets us free. That feeds us, as Jesus said, if you drink of me, you will never thirst. If you eat of me, you what? You will never hunger again. Never. So please pray for these families that they will hear the gospel. We're giving them New Testaments. It is a blessing. And, and those of you that are coming, if you're here, please become a spokesman to have and to encourage others to get involved in missions. You do it right here. I know you guys feed thousands of people with your, your soup kitchen, right? And you do a bunch of other ministries. Get involved in talking about Jesus Christ with those that don't know it. Thank you, Walter. It's going to be exciting for our team to be up there, to, to be with Walter, to see that vision, to see what this church is doing, and we'll make sure that they have the opportunity to report back and let us all know what's happening. So, Walter, thanks for being here with you. Stay up here with me. I'm going to pray in just a moment. Uh, and as I pray for Walter and the team that goes up there, uh, just another family matter uh, in, in the life of the church. Uh, some of you have heard, maybe some of you have not, that uh, yesterday Paul Rohr uh, passed away, and, uh, and so we'll have the details about the service for him uh, coming up here shortly, uh, so we want to certainly be in prayer for, for Joyce and for the rest of uh, the Roar family. So uh, let's look to the Lord now and let's pray together. Amen. Father, thank you for the work that you're doing in the world today, and thank you that you allow us, you give us the privilege to be a part of that. So thank you for Walter, thank you for his family, thank you for the, the church that they're a part of and the work that they're doing and the life that's being changed up there in New York City. Thank you for allowing Calvary Church to partner with them and to send a team and, and to send resources and to be a part of, of what you're doing. It's just great for us to be able to lift our eyes up off of ourselves and see what you're doing in the world today. And Father, as we lift our eyes off of ourselves and look to you, we pray that as well for the Roar family in the passing of Paul. Uh, we pray for Joyce. We pray for the, the, the rest of the family that you would bring peace and comfort. Uh, we rejoice that he is now with you, but it still is a, a painful time. And so we ask for your peace and your comfort that's beyond our understanding. 
And Father, as we as a church family have the opportunity to continue to worship you with our prayers, with our songs, with our giving, with opening and looking and seeing into God's word and hearing what you would have to say to us, uh, we just pray that we would be encouraged, but most of all, you would receive the honor and the glory that's due your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.
That song is filled with great theological truth, a modern-day hymn written by the Gettys, and it says, Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and your glory is over all the earth. And that's why we come to God's Word, because God's Word is what speaks to us, and God's Word helps us to know how we can be rightly related to Him, and God's Word helps us to know how we should interact with one another and what it looks like to, to live and function not only in the church but in the world that we live in. And that's why we do these book studies. That's why we look at God's Word together each and every time when we gather here on Sunday morning. And this morning, we finish unfinished, if that's possible. But it's been seven weeks and we've looked at Paul's letter to Titus and today we bring that to a close. So turn with me if you have your scriptures, Titus chapter 3, found on page 999 in the Pew Bible in front of you. So I'd love for you to have the text open, love for you to see the words of scripture, because we not only want you to be taught from God's word, we want to equip you to read and to study God's word uh, for yourself and to be able to see the text in front of you uh, helps to equip you to be able to do that. So as you're finding your way to Titus chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 8. Let me um, up the stress level in this room a few notches. If you didn't have enough tension in your life already, let me bring some your way. How many of you struggle with that feeling of things being unfinished in your life? Many of you operate off of to-do lists. How's your to-do list right now? Are there things that you didn't get to yesterday that you were hoping to, and now you're not sure when they're going to get done? And part of you is thinking, if I wasn't in church this morning, I could be getting one more thing off of my to-do list. Some of you put attending church on your to-do list just so you could check it off. Do you have any jobs around the house that are unfinished? Wives, anything that your husband just hasn't been able to get to yet? Please don't elbow him. He's trying really hard. How's your inbox in your email account? How many emails do you have there waiting for you? How many emails are coming into your inbox right now? How many emails are going to be in your inbox when you get to work tomorrow morning that's going to need your attention? Thanksgiving's coming. Are your plans in order? Do you have it all figured out? Is the house ready to go? Is the menu planned? Some of us, when things are unfinished in life, we really struggle. And it's really hard to live in that tension. And as soon as you feel like you've got a handle on it, something else is going to come in and rise the tension and the stress level again. I don't know if you can relate to this, but just yesterday I was working in the yard. Many of you know I've moved into a new home. It's been about a month, and yesterday I finally got outside, and I'm raking those leaves that are under the bushes and trying to get cleaned up and ready for the winter. And if you're anything like me, you start into one project, but in, your, in doing that project, you see something else that needs done. In the middle of raking the leaves yesterday, I noticed that our mailbox in the front of the house still has the name of the previous owner on it. I was like, I got to take care of that. I put the rake down. I went and got a can of black paint, and I painted our mailbox yesterday afternoon. Doesn't everybody paint their mailbox on Saturday afternoon? I did that yesterday. Then I realized, oh, the lawn furniture is still out. That's got to get into the basement for, for, you know, for the winter months. And it just goes on and on and on. You see all these things that need your attention. And those are good things, and those are worthy things. And I have a desire for things to be excellent in my life, so I want to get that list checked off. But sometimes I have to be careful of what I view as something that's excellent and what Scripture and what the Bible says is excellent. As I'm committing and giving myself to one more task outside, I think of my four daughters and wife inside and say, 
Maybe it's better to just put the rake down and go in and spend time with them. Maybe that's the more excellent thing to do. That's why we need to be in God's word because it brings us back to the excellent things that we should be giving our life to. Look what verse 8 says. It says, the saying is trustworthy. He's referring back to what we studied last week, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. That's where we ended last week, and I intentionally didn't put up the last part of verse 8 last week because I knew I wanted to start here this week. But Paul says, these things are excellent and profitable. What things? I think he's referring specifically to the good works that he just mentioned. So it's a reminder to us that one of the excellent and profitable things that we're called to in life are good works. And in the midst of all that we're doing, we want to be able to rise above that and see that God has desire for our faith to be lived out in good works. Not to earn God's grace, but to thank Him for it. These things, the good works, are excellent and profitable for people. For what people? The person that's on the receiving end of the good works or the person that's doing and performing the good works? I think it's both and. And you know that that's true. When somebody does a good work or a good deed for you and you receive that, you know how blessed you feel. But you also know how you feel and what you experience when you're the one that's doing the good work. Not in a prideful way, but actually in a humble way that God would allow me to use my gifts and talents to bless someone else. And you know that by doing good works, it helps to orient your mind to be others-centered instead of self-centered. Those things are excellent and profitable for people. Now, as he moves to verse 9, notice the contrast. He starts with but. And before we talk about what is in contrast, notice the end of the verse. He's just talked about what is excellent and profitable. Now he's going to talk about things that are unprofitable and worthless. Do you see the contrast that he's creating? Good works excellent and profitable. Very next verse, he's going to tell us what is unprofitable and worthless. That's why I want you to see the scripture in front of you so that you can see those connections. You should underline those connections saying, oh man, this is excellent and profitable. I want to commit and give myself to that and devote myself to that. Oh, but here's something that's unprofitable and worthless. Maybe I shouldn't spend my time on these types of things. So what are the types of things that are unprofitable and worthless? Let's go back to the, mid- the, to the beginning of the verse. He says, I want you to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Four things that he wants us to avoid. The foolish controversies in the life of the church and in the life of being with other people, there's going to be differences of opinion. There's going to be different perspectives. There's going to be controversies that are going to rise up. And I don't think controversies are wrong. But he said, let's not be foolish about them. Let's not give ourselves, let's try to determine which controversies are worth spending some time talking and working through and which ones just are foolish and should be avoided. At the end of the list, he talks about quarrels about the law. He's not talking about arguments over what the speed limit should be in your neighborhood, not those kind of laws. But there was Judaizers that were a part of the church that maybe ascribed to belief in Jesus, but they said you need to add this law and that law and bringing some of pharisaical mentality into the church. He said you need to avoid these things. 
It's in contrast, it's a little bit different than what he talked about in chapter 1. You see, in chapter 1, there was people that were preaching heresy. And Paul said to Titus, rebuke those people sharply. You can't have that in the church. You need to restore and bring them back to sound doctrine. It could be that part of this list here in chapter 3 are things that are heretical, but he doesn't say rebuke, he says avoid. Not quite as strong. He said avoid these things because they're going to lead to and cause division. The more time we spend in the church, the more time we spend in Scripture, the more we see that there's a need for unity. And there is a need for unity at Calvary Church, and I believe that we're achieving it. Many of you have been around here long enough to know that we are trying to really flesh out what it means to be a true intergenerational church. Not everybody is the same. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Diversity of ages, diversity of preferences. And it could lead to foolish controversies. And as a family, which is what we want to be, there's going to be some controversies. But how are we going to handle those? As the senior pastor of Calvary Church, I think in most regards, we're doing a pretty good job. You see, there was a day and age at Calvary Church that there was controversy over what people would wear to church. I actually feel like we've moved beyond that. There are many that feel, I want to dress up to come to church. I'm coming, I'm the audience of, of a king. And that's how I was raised and it's how I grew up and I want to wear a suit and tie. And there's others that say, I want, I want to be the same. I want to be authentic. I want to be, you know, who I am every day of the week, and I'm comfortable wearing jeans and, and a T-shirt to church. And I think we're understanding that. And one group is not looking at the other and pointing fingers and judging, and I think we understand that it's okay to dress how you want to dress on a Sunday morning. I don't feel it's a controversy at Calvary Church, and I think that's a great thing. But there's always, always the potential and the danger to slip into these foolish controversies. So we need to be reminded of this truth. Do you remember this message from back in the summer? I brought out this illustration. For those that were here, you remember the pyramid, you remember this toy. For those that weren't, let me just briefly orient you. There's levels to what we believe. There's levels of certainty to what we believe. The bottom rung, the biggest rung, the orange rung, isn't the biggest because there's the most amount of beliefs. It's the biggest because it's foundational, and these are what is essential for salvation. It's a small list. What does somebody need to know and do in order to be a born-again follower of Jesus Christ? What's on that list isn't very long, but that is worth dividing over. But as you move up the list, then you get the next rung, and those are things that are essential for orthodoxy, things that the church historically has believed. Maybe not always essential for salvation, but it's essential to for orthodoxy and what the church historically has believed. And then the next rung up is what's essential or what's distinctive about Calvary Church. There's things that are unique about what we believe here at Calvary Church and we're different than other churches, but we're not going to divide with another church over what some of those distinctives are. And then finally, the top rung. And that's our personal beliefs our personal convictions. And let me be very clear. It's good to have personal beliefs and convictions. We're not trying to bring about uniformity. We're not trying to make followers of Jesus Christ robots. Actually, just the opposite. God gains great amount of honor and glory when there's unity in the diversity of his people. And what we need to recognize and realize is that there's actually different layers of belief and certainty. 
And for some, that can be a little bit of a challenge. Because sometimes the mentality is, well, everything that I believe is on the same level. And everything that I believe about what you should wear and what's the right kind of music and what's the right way to do ministry and what the right method is and what are the right symbols and all of those types of things, some of us want to put that on the same level as what's essential for salvation. And that's a dangerous place to be. So we want to be able to think about what are the things that get us excited What are the things that could be potentially controversial? And to pause and to say, are those things essential? Or are those things my personal belief? And it's okay to have those personal beliefs, but let's not divide over those those personal beliefs. When we went through this, one of the quotes that I shared with us is this. When we treat our personal convictions as absolutes from God, we threaten the unity of the church. When we take top-rung issues and say, this is an absolute from God and I've got chapter and verse to try to prove it, we get into a real dangerous place. There is a difference between truth at this level and truth at this level. Titus, the letter to Titus, we've talked about some of these. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. That's right here. That's the gospel. That's the message of the gospel. We should unite around that message. Chapter 3, verse 4. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. That's bottom rung. That's essential for salvation. That's the things that we want to unite around. So we want to be able to keep this in perspective as we go forward, as issues come up, as things come up that we need to to talk and to work through. And let me just share something very, very briefly from my heart, just for a moment. This week marked the three-year anniversary that I've been the senior pastor of Calvary Church. And some of you say, three years? Man, it seems like it's been an eternity. It feels that way to me sometimes. There's lots of things that have changed over the last three years. There's lots of things that haven't changed. Some of us, when we see some of the things that have changed, you say, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Others say, yeah, that's great. I can see how that's valuable and fruitful for ministry. As we go forward here at Calvary Church, we're not going to agree about everything. But my challenge to all of us is that when we don't agree, when we have to talk about something, when we have to bring up an issue, when we have to talk about why we do it, I just need to challenge all of us, including myself, about the approach that we take. And are we willing to come with a humble approach and say, hey, I see that you've done this, or I see that this is now different. Could you help me to understand why you've done that? Is there a reason behind that? Can you help me to understand what that is? Because sometimes our tendency is to see something that's different or to see something that we don't agree with it and attach meaning to it that was never intended. And we accuse and we criticize and we run to conclusions that might not be very logical at all. So before we start spreading rumors of why this change and why that change and get on a campaign and why this is happening. We'd love to be able to talk about things. We'd love to be able to sit with people and help people to understand. You know why? Because we want to be a big family and we're not going to just slough something off. But could we all approach those things in the right way as we go forward? Because here's the danger. Look what he says in verse 10 about the person that is going to stir up division 
within the church. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. You would think that this person just committed some grievous sexual sin and we need to kick him out of the church. Paul's saying that about somebody that stirs up division. It's okay to think differently. It's okay to have different preferences. It's okay to disagree. But when we stir up division, Paul says that's a serious thing in the life of the church. Knowing that such a person, the person that stirs up division, is warped and sinful. Not my words. That's Paul. That's the word of God. Elevating somebody that stirs up division with other grievous sins in Scripture. They're warped and sinful and self-condemned. Scripture holds the aspect of unity and being at peace with one another in the body of Christ at a very high level level. If we are going to achieve that, we're going to all have to work hard here at Calvary Church. As an intergenerational church where we're all different, let's celebrate our diversity. We do that on the platform every Sunday morning. Let's celebrate our diversity and be unified around that. You know, I've said it before, it would be so easy to just divide people up by their preferences. But that's the way all of life works. Isn't it possible for us in the life of this local church to come together to see what God wants to do here, to see what God wants to do with people like Walter in New York City, to see what God wants to do with our global partners around? Man, what an exciting thing to be a part of if we're unified. He comes to what we would say is the end of the letter, but I promise you these are not throwaway verses. Verse 12. When I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Paul continues to facilitate ministry. He says, Titus, I left you there for a job to do, but once Artemis or Tychicus gets there to take your place, I want you to come and join me. He's facilitating ministry. He wants ministry to happen in the best way possible. Do you know why a verse like this, and I know this might be a stretch, but you know why a verse like this is important for you and me? Because there's different stages of ministry and involvement at different stages of life. You might be doing something in ministry right now that you weren't doing five years ago, and five years from now, you might be doing and involved in something that you've never even dreamed of. And that's often the way that God works. Titus was there for a purpose, but now it's time for Titus to move along and be a part of a different ministry. Celebrate where God has you right now and be faithful to the ministry that he has you in right now. And it's okay if that looks different in the future. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. You know, there could have been the potential for there to be conflict and bitterness and jealousy between Paul and Apollos. We understand that Apollos was probably a better speaker, a better communicator than Paul. Some said, I follow Peter and I follow Apollos. Paul could have had some bitterness towards him, but he said, no, he's different. He has different gifts that I do, and I want to be a part of facilitating ministry. I don't want to be bitter and jealous about who he is and what his gifts are. See that they lack nothing. Provide for them because I know if you do, they will continue to have fruitful ministry. Verse 14. And let our people, let our people, some sentimental words from Paul and the way he felt about God's people. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. What if we just had our eyes open? What if we just prayed every day, God, is there any needs that you want me to meet today? Is there any needs that you want me to meet with somebody that I work with or somebody in my neighborhood or somebody that I come across unexpected? What are those urgent needs that I might be ready to do for someone? Isn't it interesting to me? It's interesting to me. I might 
not be interesting to you. Look at the beginning of the verse. Let our people learn. You know what that means? When you have to learn to do something, that means it doesn't come naturally. You have to learn to ride a bike. You have to learn to tie your shoes. Let us learn to devote ourselves to good works. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. You see some words in there? Greet, love, faith, grace. It's hard to be divided if these words characterize our life and our church. If we're greeting one another and loving one another and showing grace to one another, man, shouldn't that mark our lives and the life of Calvary Church? Unfinished. The series is finished, but hopefully the impact of the book never will be. Here's some thoughts, some personal thoughts. It'll just take me a minute or two to share some thoughts with you that are things that I took away from this book. They might mean nothing to you. These are things I preached on, and as God did a work in my life through this series, here's what was important to me. Number one, remember the be versus do concept? Beginning of chapter two, I had you underline all the to be, to be, to be, to be. So often we're focused on our to-do list, but Paul says to Titus, I want the older men to be. I want the older women to be. I want the younger women to be. I want the young men to be. Some of us need to focus a little bit more on who God wants us to be and who he wants us to become and a little bit less on our to-do list. Chapter two, older and younger. We need one another in the life of the church. It's not or. Some churches do that. We're gonna focus on this demographic or this group of people. No, scripture calls the local church to have older and younger because you need those relationships for the church to function and to be healthy. Number three, can we get excited about the right things? Do you remember that message when I was jumping around up here on the stage like a crazy person? Let's get excited about the right things. Let's get excited about essential issues, bottom level issues, the grace and the salvation and the redemption that Jesus Christ brings to our lives. Let's get excited about the right things. And finally, this could be a summary statement for the book. Believe in God, be devoted to good works. Believe in the God that's presented in this book. Believe in the God whose grace has appeared bringing salvation. Believe in the God who's good and loving and who has saved us and regenerated us and renewed us and poured out the Holy Spirit upon us and justified us by his grace. Believe in that God, not the God that you've created in your own mind. And as a result of believing in that God, then let's be devoted to good works. It's who I want to be. It's who we want to be, Calvary Church. Now, don't leave. As we've done any time we do a book study, we get to the end, we've gone through it verse by verse, we've studied it, there's value in hearing it all in one sitting. So we have the privilege, as we often do, to have piercing word here, and I'm going to invite Aaron House to join me up here on the platform. And as he does and prepares to perform the book of Titus for us. They're going to set the stage for him behind us. So Aaron and I are just going to uh, have a moment here together. Many of you know Aaron. You know Piercing Word. You know the ministry. They've got a table out in the lobby that you can connect with. But Aaron, I know that there's some here that don't necessarily know you and know the ministry. In a sentence or two, tell us about Piercing Word. Sure. Well, uh, the mission of Piercing Word is to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church. And we do that through scripture performance and discipleship. So basically what we do with scripture performance is we take the words of the Bible straight from the ESV version and uh, we put it creatively and dramatically on the stage. Yeah, it's great. You know the heart of piercing word, it's scripture. Um, it's all Aaron's gonna say in this performance is scripture, but as he often does, put a little modern day mm -hmm. spin on it, modern day twist. So what are, what are they getting set up here? Uh, this is Paul's office. Okay, so we're going to be in Paul's office. 
and, uh, and see how the book of Titus is presented from Paul's office. Um, now tonight, yeah. this is a great day for Calvary Church and Piercing Word. That's great. Tonight at 6 o'clock in the lower auditorium, we're going to hear more from Piercing Word. They're going to yeah. do the discipleship team that you work with is going to perform the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, it's been exciting. We have a discipleship team of high school and college-age students, and uh, it's throughout the fall semester here that we've been doing this and, and other semesters. And so we have a team of eight, and they have memorized the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, and we've been studying it throughout the semester. Each one has been ha had the privilege of leading a Bible study. We've taught them how to do that, how to lead uh, a Bible study, and how to be accountable to one another, and they have accountability partners, and we've really been growing together um, as, as members of the body of Christ, and it's going to be a great time in the book of Ecclesiastes tonight. Yeah, so. that's great. Tonight, 6 o'clock in the lower auditorium. Now, before you start, I just have to confess something to you. Every time you guys do this, I'm always so nervous that you're going to make a mistake. So I have my Bible open <laughs> because if you like lose your line, I want to be able to give it to you. Should I feel that tension and that stress? No. No, you've got it. No. You've got it down. So I, uh, you can relax. Okay. Can I'm going to relax. relax. It's okay. Let's all relax <laughs> and enjoy and hear scripture, the book of Titus. They're all yours, Aaron. All right. <sighs> Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus. <laughs> Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Savior. Uh-huh. What? Oh. This is why I left you in Crete, that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and whose children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination for an overseer, as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard, violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold fast to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, evil talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths or the commands of people who turn away from the truth. For to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. 
They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the younger women to, be, to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands so that the Word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a, a model of good works. In your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be ashamed, <laughs> having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants, likewise, are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They're to be well-pleasing. <clears throat> not argumentative, not pilfering. Uh, it, but, it, but to showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. <laughs> for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, let us stray, subject to very various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His great mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs with Him in the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies and dissensions, and genealogies and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, uh, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. And do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so that they may help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. <laughs> yeah. well, 
all those who are with me send greetings to you. Uh, uh, greet those who love us in the faith. Uh huh. Now, grace be with you all. It is a powerful, powerful ministry, and you can connect with Aaron and his wife, Emily. They have a table out there in the lobby if you want to talk with them further. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock, to hear Ecclesiastes from the young people that he works with. Um, And as we go this morning, would you stand and let me pray for us as this series comes to a a close, and we look forward to uh, what we have in the days ahead here at Calvary Church. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's the truth Thank you that it tells us how to be rightly related to you. Thank you that it tells us how to live in this world, that it, to live in the church. And as we've just heard, as the word just washed over us, may it have that cleansing effect in our lives. Uh, may it do its work. May it not return void. So we're so grateful that we have your word. Thank you for giving it to us and communicating it to us. And now may we be people that since we've heard the word, May we put it into practice. May we live it out in our lives so that it would impact us, impact others, but most of all, bring you the honor and the glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Reminder of the welcome gathering that's going to start in just a moment. Love to be able to connect with you there. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon.